Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Brenda. I'm a recovering lesbian, Hispanic, Catholic, alcoholic, drug addict, four-figured woman. There's a girl in my home group that she's like, do you have to lead off with that? I said, yes, I, I, I think that these people need to know who they're dealing with right away. <laughs> Les quiero dar muchas gracias por la oportunidad de estar aquí con ustedes ahora. Le doy gracias primeramente a Dios por la vida que me ha concedido. Y con su permiso voy a hablar en inglés. For those of you who don't understand Spanish, what I said was, hello. (laughs) I can tell you already that some of you watch way too much television. The way I know that is that I started to speak in Spanish and someone turned to the person next to him and said, who hit the SAP button? (laughs) Y'all are so cute, you know, don't inconvenience alcoholics. Y'all are like, is this going to be bilingual? (laughs) Cause that's like subtitles. They ruin the movie. I'd like to thank the committee for the invitation to come and share my story with you today, and especially Mark. Um, and they never let you pick anyone else. It's your own damn fault. Um, <laughs> I've, um, my, I have been clean and sober by the grace of a God I didn't believe in since July the 3rd of 1990. And I'm indeed grateful for that time. Um, When I got here, one of my first impressions was I walked into the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and my first conscious thought was, I don't know where we are, but we can't be very far from hell. (laughs) Being here with you this weekend, I'm not sure where we are, but we can't be very far from the fourth dimension. I've made it a point while I've been sober to never speak at a place where it's being recorded. I just couldn't afford to leave any evidence. <laughs> so the tape from the workshop yesterday and the tape from this seed, this this session today will be, um, well, I can explain. You know, <laughs> it'll be the first um, time I've done that, and I don't know. All I know is that if the CD or the tape gets somewhere 10 years from now and some newcomer's listening to it in the car, if they, if all they get is, God, if she made it, I can do it. That's all that matters to me. You know, I don't care. Um, it's funny because I have, I went to a conference in, um, I guess it was in Cedar Canyon or somewhere and found out that they were actually recording it. You know, that I guess they knew and they didn't tell me before, whatever. And the guy comes up after and gave me one copy of the tape. So when Mark called, Mark called and said, can you send us a tape? I'm like, what do you want to hear? You know, I, I, he, he meant of me. <laughs> you know, I'm an alcoholic. I'm like, buy your own damn music. What? <laughs> I said, well, you, okay, Mark. I said, I've got one. I said, I'll send it to you. And if you could just like hold on to it and send it back, um, that'd be really good. And being the alcoholic he is, he calls in January and he said, listen, we got your tape. Oh, I have good news and bad news. Good news is we'd love for you to come share your story. I said, yes, I will. He said, bad news is that we were listening to the tape. It broke in the middle. We don't know how any of your crap ends. (laughs) So I'm here to tell the rest of the story. Um, 
If, if anything I share with you today comes out in any kind of um, sequential, chronological order, no one will be more surprised than me. <laughs> I'm going to share it as it comes, and you can go home and sift through it later, okay? <sighs> By the way, Lila mentioned she wasn't going to be here today. Kimberly mentioned to me the other day that she was seven months old when Lila sober, um, let's not tell, okay? <laughs> God knows what that's going to do, you know? I'm really glad to be here. I'm glad to be sober, present, and accounted for in my body, okay? Here is where I am. I am nowhere else but right here in front of you, live, in color, unplugged, Okay? <laughs> Somebody said to me yesterday after the workshop, she said, damn, she said, you're the first one I ever thought they need to videotape instead of record. She said, because when they listen to the tape or the CD, it's going to sound really pissed and they're not going to get it. It was funny. There's some young kid running around here before the workshop yesterday. He says, man, you look so serene. You look so peaceful. I hate you. <laughs> Uh, okay, so here's the deal. What I want to know when I go to a speaker meeting is, are they going to suck? Okay? Because you're thinking to like invest an hour, and I think we should just all up front, right? So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about, and then you can decide whether or not you need to hear any of it, you know? Um, I am going to talk about... Pain, surrender, peace, God, love, forgiveness, holding on, letting go. I'll slow down. <laughs> Sorry. Um. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> She's so Let's give it up for these people down here. All right. I don't know sign language, but that last one was like, I don't know what the hell she said. <laughs> don't change my story, okay? <laughs> All right, enough of the crap. I'm going to talk about me. I'm going to talk about me, and I have a sponsor long ago who said, if I talk about me and it pisses you off, okay. <laughs> you know, this is just the stuff I've had to do to improve the quality of my life. That's it. That's it. It's just the places I've had to go, the tools I've had to pick up, all that. And that's what I've come to talk to you about, and I've come to talk to you about God. And the reason I've come to talk to you about God is I don't talk to you about God. I don't have anything else to say. And when I say God, please don't let poverty of my own language keep you from learning the message. All I'm talking about is whatever makes the sun come up and go to sleep at night without my direct supervision. <laughs> you know, if we waited for me sometime about 1130, I'd walk out. You know, it just happens without me, you know, and something takes a seed and turns it into a tomato, uh, an alcoholic and turns him into a musician. Something takes an addict and turns him into a miracle. That's all I'm talking about. Now, I, I don't want to stand up and waste your time. I'm going to make a huge, huge assumption. I'm going to assume that you got the drinking going up, fuck, screwing everything up as bad. I'm, I'm going to assume you got that part down. Okay? So what I'm going to talk about, you know, I, don't, I have a problem sometimes when I go to speaker meetings and they've been here like 400 years and they only get to recovery like seven minutes before the hour is over. I'm 
thinking, I don't give a rat's ass what happened to you before. What's happened to you since you came to A? This is where I live. I want to know. So, my drunken log is three sentences old. I ran at the beginning to feel good. Then I drank to feel normal. Then I drank to not feel. Now, if you understand that, I don't need to explain it. If you don't understand, keep coming back. That's it. Now, let's fast forward to when I showed up in AA. I want to talk about what happened and what it's like now. So, I have to tell you, I grew up in a little town called Denial. <laughs> and, and me and all my loved ones live there. I'm one of nine kids in my family. There's seven girls, two boys, one mom, one dad. Um, and there were, I guess, like um, nine. There were like 15 of us originally, and the other kids didn't make it out of childhood. Um, the child before me died. The child after me died. What are the odds? Um, um, we all still live in San Angelo. That's out in West Texas where there's only two gay people and we're all here this weekend. Um, <laughs> but I think it's catching. <laughs> As we speak, testing the water back home. Um, and so I know that the only part of my story you care about is the part that sounds like yours. So I won't like do the childhood stuff other than to tell you that it was the most um, painfully wonderful thing that ever happened to me. Um, I was 24 when I sobered up. I'm 37 now. Um... I only quit drinking because I couldn't take one more drink. My suggestion to the newcomers, don't quit before that moment. You know, you'll just, it'll, it'll just hurt. You know? <laughs> Why go to AA if you're not done? You know, what the hell is that about? So drink until that last drink. Drink until that last tablespoon of NyQuil. Drink until that last swallow of Listerine. Drink till that last drop of vanilla extract. Drink until one more swallow of shaving lotion. And then, then, if you're ready, you can join us on the broad highway. I was 24 years old, and I knew my father was an alcoholic, whether he knew it or not. And I was just living in a lot of insanity. So I called up a treatment facility, I don't know why, and I said, listen, I've got a problem with my father. Um, he, um, <laughs> look, if y'all are going to get ahead of me, I'm not going to share. <laughs> I am on the phone right now. I said, listen, I've got a problem. Would y'all stop laughing? You're cutting into my time. <laughs> um, I've got a problem with my father, and I'm really angry with him, and I'd love to come to the thing that you have there, the treatment facility. And, and the young lady who answered the phone, she said, wonderful. She said, on Tuesday is family day. Come on. So next Tuesday morning, I got up, showered, changed, went to the thing, and there were a bunch of alcoholics and asked who had family day. And I walked around and asked, do you have family here? And they and then on some poor guy that said, no, I don't have any. I said, I will be family today because I don't have an addict here. <laughs> How cute. They let us do role play stuff. And we were like really heated with each other and never seen each other before. It was great. <clears throat> so at the end, I hugged him. So I'd be back next Tuesday. It was a it was a four Tuesday thing. I went every week. You know, <laughs> I felt really close to him. By the time we were done, 
And it was the last Tuesday of this meeting, and, and so I was saying bye to the counselor lady and bye to my little addict and bye to the others. And, and the counselor lady said, um, you go to a meeting? A meeting of what? She said, an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. It's an open meeting. Anybody can come. And before I could answer, she said, get in the van. <laughs> if you're new and anybody ever says to you, get in the van, do not get in the van. <laughs> so here we are, me and 12 little addicts in the van. We get to the AA group, they let us out. I feel like them, I don't know why. So they went into the AA meeting and I went into the Alan meeting because my father was my problem, right? Um, so I went to Al-Anon and they immediately started acing bets on how long it would take. Shut up, sir. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he may have been one of the ones that bet. <laughs> Never told me I needed to go to AA. They just always told me, you know, there's under door over there. <laughs> I thought we could get a door. And, um, so I went to Allen on for a little while. And then the lady who said, get in the van, that lady, she was in the lobby one day. And I said, you know, can I ask you something? I said, my sister made me really mad yesterday, and I went and bought a big old 32 cup of beer at the party barn, and I drank it, and I didn't want it. She said, oh. I said, and then the day after that, my sister made me really mad, and I went and bought a 32-ounce cup of beer, and I drank it, and I didn't want it. She said, oh. She said, I have an idea. We're sitting in the lobby of AA, there's 200 people standing around, and she says, why don't you just say, my name's Brenda, and I'm an alcoholic. And with all the indignation I could summon, I looked at her and I said, because it would not be the truth. <laughs> Look, I told you I grew up in denial. Get off my ass. <laughs> she said, that's fine if it's not the truth. It doesn't have to be the truth. Just say it. Now she's starting to piss me off, right? Oh, I'm the spiritual speaker. Was I supposed to cuss? Yeah, whatever. Yeah. So anyway, so I said, okay, okay, my name is Brenda and I'm a... Uh, <clears throat> my name is Brenda. Oh, you're going to go? It's just fixing to get good. Bye-bye. Um, <laughs> get the tape. <laughs> I they're not mad. I, I can explain. I don't care. <laughs> so anyway, the long and short of it is I finally said it. And when I said, my name is Brenda, I'm an alcoholic, everything that I had ever hidden behind came crashing down around me. And I started to sob uncontrollably on that couch. And she said, you know what? Tomorrow's Friday night. There's a women's meeting here at 7 o'clock. Here's my phone number. I'll meet you here at the meeting. So I went home and thought of a million reasons why I couldn't go. I couldn't go. I mean, you know, I was going to need to take care of the dog, and I didn't have one. Um, <laughs> there were so many things I needed to do, and I couldn't go. I co and I picked up the phone a hundred times that day to tell her, I can't go. I, I went. I went. And I stood literally at the door of the Alcoholics Anonymous room, and the lady, the van lady, she said, I brought you this far. If you're coming in, you're going to have to come alone. And I stood at the threshold and went, okay, hold on. And I stepped into Alcoholics Anonymous. My first meeting was on honesty. My second meeting was on truth. God had big ones for me right away. I went to Friday night meeting and um, there were a bunch of women there. It was a women's meeting and there were about um, 11 or so of them. Um, I just noticed that I was impressed because I didn't know what a woman alcoholic looked like. Oh, shut up. 
Um, I'd been looking at one in the mirror for a long, long time. I looked around and went, they don't smell very bad. Hmm. So the meeting was over and then this lady stood up and she said, you go eat at the kettle with us. I'm an alcoholic and an addict. I'm at the end dying. This white woman wants to know, do I want to go to the kettle with them? I opened my mouth and I went, yes, I'd love to. <laughs> she said, good, get in the van. <laughs> but you know, I'm smart. I'm smart. I'm extremely intelligent. I said, I'll take my car. She said, get in the van. <laughs> so I go to the van. I get, in, I get in the van. We go to the kettle. At one point, they, they sat us at a long table in the back. At one point, I looked down the table and realized I'm sitting around the table with 11 white women. The image of the Last Supper came to me. All I could think was, I hope to God none of my friends see me in here. <laughs> and at that moment, I got Jesus. You know what I mean? Um, so we went to dinner, and the lady said, the van lady, she said, um, uh, there's a meeting at 11 o'clock in the morning. Will you, will you come? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be there. You know I'm going to be there. In the back of my mind thinking, you're never going to see my ass again. So I showed up to the 11 o'clock meeting the next day. I show up, the meeting's in the, right in the middle of it, and all of a sudden we silence, okay? And, and there's like cops coming, there's a fight in the lobby. I walk out the door, and there's this guy with this huge 44-ounce mug. He took it, hit this guy upside the forehead, blood everywhere, people are screaming, everybody's pissed. Somebody's saying, take it outside, take it outside. The cops come in, and I, I thought two thoughts at the same time. I thought, you know what? This is where I came from. I don't need this. I don't need to come to Alcoholics Anonymous to see this. I can go home to see this. And the other thought I thought was, I'm home. <laughs> I mean, there were blood and cups and everything, you know. <laughs> My God loves me. So I kept coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, and God bless the women Alcoholics Anonymous. They took me under their wings, mostly because they were for you. Um, <laughs> and, um, and they tried to help me, and I didn't want it. I didn't know what I wanted, but hell isn't it. You know, people would say, if you want what we have, I'm like, what are you driving? Um, So they helped me. And there was this one woman, her name was Pam, and she said, listen, here's my number. I, I think I need to sponsor you. And I said, yeah, whatever. I said, she said, call me. I said, who do I call you? She said, well, call me anytime you have an idea. I didn't have a whole lot going on for me, but I did have a lot of ideas. <laughs> so I'm rocking right along. I'm going to meetings. I'm trying to pay attention. They're trying to help me. I'm trying not to let them. I was angry. I was just miserable. You know, the spiritual condition we all get here in. And this lady said after a meeting, listen, why don't you help pick up the ashtrays? I said, oh, hell no, she didn't just say that. <laughs> it's because <'cause> brown. <laughs> and they need a janitor. <laughs> and I'm going to have to nip this in the bud. So 
I went to the furthest corner of the room and picked up this huge, huge square glass ashtray and flung it across the A room toward a large trash can on the other side of the room. The lady calls me over. She says, come here. <laughs> I didn't have a problem. I thought in my mind, I take you. <laughs> she said, come here. She said, um, we're not going to start you with ashtrays. She said, why don't you just pick up the styrofoam coffee cups? <laughs> so I stood with cups. And I wasn't happy to be there. And I wanted you to know I wasn't happy to be there. I did not need you and you needed to know that. So I had AA meetings and I'd bring my newspaper. And I would sit in the corner of the room, and as soon as the thing started, I'd open the sports page. And there was a guy there, God love him, his name's, well, okay, Wally. And it would like really, it would like really, really make him mad, because he was about the business of recovery, and I was about the business of pissing him off. And he'd say, you know, if you're going to bring your paper, you will just get the hell out of here. I loved him. So the next day, I brought my paper and my headphones. I cracked my up, so I'd get my paper out and I'd put on my headphones. Now, they weren't on, weren't on. I could hear every word that was being said, but I couldn't let you know that I, that I needed it. You know, and I made a few meetings and, and I started to feel better. And I went home and I told my mom, I said, Mom, I said, I got that A thing, it's going all right. She said, good, good. I said, they don't have a leader. Do you know that, like, they don't have a leader? She said, oh. She said, well, good, we'll go back. I said, I am. I think they're going to ask me. <laughs> so I went back to Alcoholics Anonymous like I was running her office, okay? <laughs> I was glad to greet her. Hello, welcome to hey, How the hell are you? <laughs> and I started to make some friends. And there was this guy. He was a coke addict coming to Alex Anonymous. And his name was Pat. And, and we visited and talked and stuff. And I would tell him, you know, geez, I've got 30 minutes. I'm crazy. I don't know what to do. I really want to drink. You know, and, and I'm trying to listen. I'm trying to pay attention. I'm trying to be promoted from cups. I'm doing everything I can. <laughs> I said, and I don't know what I'll do. I think I'm going to drink. And he comes over to where I am and he says, you know what? I know exactly how you feel. I was there. That happened to me. I said, all right. I said, what did you do? He said, well, I really think that what needs to happen is you need to sleep with me. I said, all right, hold on just a minute. Pam? I just had an idea and I need to run it by you. <laughs> she said to call anytime I had an idea, right? I said, I'm up at the AA meeting and I was talking to Pat and I was telling him that I really, really wanted to drink and I didn't know what to do about it. And he said that what I really needed to do about it was to sleep with him. And I was just going to call and check that out with you because you told me to call you. It's for you. I don't know what she told him, but I haven't seen that son of a bitch since.
So I tell the women I sponsor, if anybody in Alcoholics Anonymous has for your phone number, tell them your sponsor wants to know what step they're on. You come check that out with them. We'll confirm whether or not they need your number. Works for me. Um, so I, I'm in time. I'm feeling much better. I get my one-year birthday. Call, I, well, you know, I need to tell you something important. And then I was drinking just with my family. I didn't have to go out in house, you know, geez, we're all drank the same, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Groundhog, Leg Day, Christmas, it doesn't matter, you know, and, and I was drinking with them and I got to treatment and, um, and they let me out on my first weekend pass. And I was so excited because I missed my family. I missed them. I love them. They, what I knew and who I had and where I'd been and all that. And I called my sister and I said, come give me. I said, they're going to let me home for the weekend. And I was so excited. She pulled up and we went, she, you know, and, and I got in the car with her and I said, I'm so excited. And she said, good. I was like, we're going to stop over at my brother's house and then we'll go on. And I said, oh, so I get to my brother's house and they've laid out this huge keg party to celebrate that I got a weekend off treatment. <laughs> and it scared me. I walked in, I wanted to see him all and I loved him and I missed him and, and I couldn't drink. And my older sister came to me and she said, look, if you're going to be part of this family, you're going to have to drink. And I started to cry. I started to cry because I missed them. And I knew to go. So I called I called the treatment place and I told them to come get me. And that was the day that I decided that if I needed to lose my family to be sober that I was willing. I got my one year, you know, feeling better and my kid I've t- I have nine, there's nine of us, right? I have 23 nephews and nieces, 11 nephews and nieces. My sobriety station changes every day. You know, I'm staying sober. I'm finding a way to live my life. I'm showing up for these kids. I mean, I have been to more violin recitals than should be required of any sober person. But I go and I'm excited and I'm thrilled and it's the grandest piece of music ever heard. You know? And they get down off the stage and they're like, it was good, right? And I'm like, wow! It was excellent. And I'll go, my, I have a nephew who's got um, um, muscular dystrophy and cerebral palsy and he's in the Special Olympics. I go and I take signs and I, you know, Eric's aunt, I run along the side of the road, you know, and we, you know, and, and, they're like, is she sir? You know? <laughs> and I do. I show up with signs and streamers and banners. My 18 year old nephew went and took his driving test. I was at the DPS office. Yay! <laughs> and, and I brought a camera. I've got pictures. Wow! You know? So I try and show up for all their stuff, man. Because I told God one thing. I said, if you help me get sober, I promise I'll do everything I can not to miss one more moment of my life. God made good on his promise. So I show up for all of it. You know, and I got one year sober and I called my sister who said, if you're going to be part of the family, you got to drink. And I said, hey, I got one year and I'm calling to tell you. She said, God, you've been there a year and they haven't made you the present yet. I said, things move slowly there. (laughs) So, when I start sponsoring women, the first question is, how do you feel about ashtrays? You know? (laughs) Um, I think someone should have asked me, right? You know, they just started me off, you know? And, and by the time I moved up to Ashtrays, I somehow had the feeling I'd been promoted. And hey, yeah. Um, so I start sponsoring women and I pray on the phone with them all the time. This one's for you, Mark. I pray on the phone with them all the time. You know, we say the third step prayer, the seventh step prayer, and we just go do that deal. And they call wherever, whenever I'm on my cell phone. Now, 
I, t- I, w- I was a teacher and I taught sixth grade and then my, my kids move on to the junior high and I was at the junior high for an awards banquet of some sort and it's in an old auditorium in an old building and I didn't have very good reception but it was one of the women that I sponsor and she called and she goes, I really need to pray. I said, okay. I didn't know the prayer so I'm like, repeat after me and it's like, creator. She said, my creator. I am now with, she goes, I can't hear you. I said, I'm now willing. She said, I, I can't hear you. I'm not willing. She said, huh? I said, I am now willing that you should have all of me. At the exact same moment that one of the boys that I taught two years earlier was standing behind me. I turned around, I saw him standing there, and he said, Sorry, miss. <laughs> Crap like that happens to recovery all the time. You know, how was I ever going to say to the boy, I pray? And he's like, Yeah. <laughs> um, so I start sponsoring women. I start feeling a little better. And um, about two years came for me. And I wanted to die. I just wanted to die. I mean, I was going to AA, going to institutions, making coffee, sponsoring women. Go, yeah, I was doing the whole damn deal. Working the steps to the best of my ability, and I wanted to die. And I went and sat with the therapist I was seeing, and she said, you know what, if you can't leave this office and tell me that you're not going to kill yourself, then you need to go to treatment. And I looked at her, and I said, you obviously do not know who the hell you're talking to. If there was a poster child, I would be it. And you know, they need minorities. Um... <clears throat> So, so I went to the treatment facility and I hung my head in the doctor and he said, honey, how long have you been suffering from depression? And I thought, oh, there's a name. How I feel? I didn't know. I didn't know. I said, I don't know. He said, oh, we can take care of that. You know what I found out when I was two years sober? That I was trying to stay sober um, with some old ideas. Some old ideas about me, some old ideas about you, some old ideas about God. My old ideas and my new way of life were doing this. And there was no peace. So I went to treatment every day for 15 days, outpatient. You know who took me to treatment? The two women that I was sponsoring. (laughs) It was great. One of them would pick me up at 6 in the morning. And drive me to the treatment facility and the other one would go pick me up at 11 at night and take me back. Why'd they do that? Because that's what I taught them how to do. Right? That's why they knew what to do when I needed it. And I tell the women I sponsor, I'm going to give you the best I have because I'm going to need it back from you someday. (laughs) So I went to treatment for 15 days. You know what we did? We took these three little boxes, these three little lids, me, you, God, lids off of them and started digging out all the shit that was in there. The ideas I had about you was that you'd love me as long as you could get something from me. The ideas I had about you is that I was only as useful as I was to you. That you would hurt me given the opportunity. That if I trusted you, you'd hurt me. That if I loved you, you'd leave. The ideas I had about me was that I was worthless, useless, fat, ugly, meaningless. Or, I mean, all of that. The ideas I had about God is that he was after me, didn't love me. That, you know, he was ashamed. If there was one kid he should have gotten, you know, not, not made happen, it was me, you know. And, and I walked around with that information. So we dug all that crap out of there, you know, and the stuff stuck to the bottom. Turned out that didn't belong to me at all. So I took it back to the Catholic Church and gave it back to him. Um, So I leave treatment after 15 days with these three brand new cleaned out boxes. And I said, God, tell me the truth. I don't even know what the truth is. And there was a lady standing next to me and she she looked over. She goes, you know what? She goes, you're really funny. And I said, thanks. I appreciate it. And I'm walking down the sidewalk and God said, it's for your box. I went, oh, I'm funny. So I put it in my box. Then somebody else a few days later said, you know what? You're really stubborn. God said, that's for your box. (laughs) To which I said, whatever. (laughs) 
That's what I've been doing the whole time I've been in Alcoholics Anonymous, getting out ideas, you know, <laughs> you know, so if anything I say makes you really, really mad, don't do that. I'm going to leave here in a minute, meet somebody in the hall, they'll share a new view and a new view. Ah, and then you still, ah, wow, that was good. That was good. And be on to something else, still be mad, don't do that. No, I have helped more people start reading the books than anybody I know. You know, I would quote stuff from it. They're like, that's not in there. Well, something that is in there. (laughs) Besides, Lila said there were leprechauns. Get off my ass. So people would like start reading the book so that they could come back and tell me what it actually said. I loved it. I said, oh, you're welcome. I love Alcoholics Anonymous, man. Absolutely. It's why I show up to work every day. It's why I show up for my life. It's why I show up for my relationships. You know, it's why I show up for whatever's going on. So I'm less than 30 days sober. I turned my will and my life over to God, and I woke up in a college class studying literature in the early 1800s. I was in college. Do not turn your will and your life over unless you've got some time. (laughs) So I started going to college. I don't know. There's the little book. It says if you want a degree in this, take that. So I just did that. I just started taking the classes and I'd show up and see who's paid for me to go to school. And I don't know who it was and it really doesn't matter. You know, and then, and I got, and I went through and I, and I got it all done and, and you know, there were some things that I knew were missing from my recovery, like that I had missed the the time when I was supposed to be a little person and when all the big people were supposed to be present and accounted for. That didn't happen. The time when I was a little person and somebody was supposed to pick me up and say, Man, I love you. You have the most beautiful eye I have ever seen. Of all the little girls God could have given me, I'm so glad I got you. Somebody should have said that to me. Didn't happen. So I'm in college. I'm working it out, you know. And it's so cute because there's a bunch of 18-year-old kids. I'm 24 now, and they think I'm their age. And you want to go to the party? I'm like, I used up my quota. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, but you're the funnest one of all of us. I'm like, if you think funnest is the word, keep going to college. (laughs) So I'm in school and I get a letter in the mail from the dean. Oh, hell no. When you get a letter like from the dean, don't open it, right? So I stuck it in the drawer where my underwear, I guess you didn't need to know that, but like in a drawer... And I hit it, and there was no way I was reading it because I thought it's up. They know, they know I'm an alcoholic. They know, they know I don't belong here. They and I'm not, I'm I'm not reading it. I didn't get it. Drove me nuts. Became insane really, really quickly. Now I, I, I had opened it and I looked and 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 I thought no, I can't. And and one day, like at three in the morning, I call my sponsor. You know, (laughs) because that's when your disease will come get your ass. By the way. I called her and I said, I got a letter and I don't know what it is and it's from the dean. And she said, read it to me. I said, okay. It says, dear Miss Hustle, um, you made the dean's list and we want. At this point, she starts laughing hysterically. <laughs> now I'd seen that it said the dean's list and I'd been on a lot of lists and I didn't want to be on no more. No more. So I'm fo- at another letter a couple of years later, and it said, uh, Ms. Hosso, if you're actually going to graduate, you're 12 hours away, and you need to actually come file a degree plan at some point. You know? <laughs> okay. So I finished my last semester, and I graduated from college with a teacher. You know, and... and I- I think that's great. I think it's great that I can hear that and people won't run from the room to go check their kids out of school, you know? Um, <laughs> you know, and, and it's graduation day. It's graduation day and I, this is it. This is the day I've been waiting for and I'm so glad. And, 
and and my family was going to go. There's 6,000 people in the Coliseum in San Angelo, Texas, and I've got my cap and gown on, and the time has arrived. I'm so, so excited, and I walk in, and in this mass of human beings, I look over to my right, and I see all my nephews and nieces hold up signs that say, She's our aunt! <laughs> They've got streamers and balloons. I mean, it was a party. And they called my name. And you know, they move you like through cattle, you know, a little cattle run and stuff. Oh, hell no. (laughs) Oh, no. Somebody had made an announcement that if you open your envelope and there's a note in there to go see the registrar's office that you can pick up your degree at a later time. I'm thinking not. So they called my name. I stepped up on the stage. I got my envelope. I said, hold it. I'm going to open this baby right here. I took it out and there's my degree. Absolutely. And I looked up in the sea of people and I saw my father. Now, it had been a long time since I opened my father's eyes. One of the last times had been one night when he called me into his room and he said, you know what, I'm so sick of who you are. I'm so sick of the fact that you make it hard for your mother. The day your mother dies, I better not see one tear in your eye. And if you start crying, I swear I'm going to knock out every goddamn tooth in your mouth. Do you understand me? I said, yes, sir, I do. So I look up into this sea of people and I caught my father's eye. And I didn't look away. And my father from his seat way over there went. I went, all right. All right. So I started teaching. Get to my Friday after school, you know. I, I made it a week. You know, <laughs> That's like record time for an alcoholic, you know. <laughs> I, te- I teach grade. Why? Because they get my jokes. <laughs> I would have taught the younger kids, but it was wasted material. <laughs> my little kids are so cute. My children are so cute. I'll tell you about them in just a minute. Let me, well, let me tell you now. Okay, I get it. Um, <laughs> we ought not be organized. Get the hell off my ass. Um, so my kids, you know, there's this toss test, you know, which measures your whole worth as a person. And, and the school district, in order to help, sends massive amounts of material to give them. And I put it all in the closet and never opened it. And I taught these kids what was in the books. I asked them, what do you want to learn about today? And we went and did that, and it was absolutely marvelous. These kids started to feel really good about themselves. I thought, they don't know math or English, so get that. Or else they feel really good. <laughs> you know? They took the toss. They scored perfect hundred in reading and a perfect hundred in math collectively. <laughs> the next day, the superintendent's office called and said, Congratulations, Ms. Hossel. We'd like for you to give an in-service to about 800 teachers on how you mastered the skills of teaching these children to perform perfect hundreds. I said, I would love to. <laughs> So I get in front of this auditorium and they said, um, they said I said, I'd like to start with questions. What do you want? Yes, the manipulative board that shows the 18 objectives. I wondered how you were able to formulate the idea behind. <laughs> the lady was talking. I'm thinking in my head, have any of your students shot themselves? <laughs> so I get up and. Stop! Y'all are cutting into my time. I'm talking fast. So, so I tell him, I tell him, I said, listen, the manipulatives and everything the superintendent sent, I really, really appreciate it. We will at point use it for uh, notepads because we will recall it's the responsible thing to do. I said, I didn't use any of it. It's in the closet. What I did was that I showed up emotionally and physically and spiritually for eyes of these children every day and it changed who they are. I gave these 
12-year-old children permission to feel the way they feel, to experience what they experience, to dream what they want to dream about. I said, okay, I showed it and made a difference. Go do that. Go do that or go do something else. <laughs> do not work here where the future comes to you every day. Don't do that. They never let me tell they're in service again. <laughs> I had a little boy in my class. His name was Thomas, and one day he just killed over. I mean, he didn't die, but <laughs> he just, he, he fell completely out of his chair, okay? He, like, was, he, I didn't know he was passed out. I thought he was being funny. It happened a lot in my room, okay? I said, Thomas, that's so cute. Get up, boy. And they're like, Miss, his eyes are closed. <laughs> I'm at the board working a problem. I said, well, kick him and see. <laughs> so I go, I go back there. It turns out he's actually passed out completely. So I slapped a little bit and woke him up. I said, hey, you know, what do you want? Not do the homework? What? What? And he'd actually passed out. I called his parents. They called the ambulance, took him to the hospital. It was about two in the afternoon and he's back. I said, Thomas, why are you here? He said, my mom's outside. She wants to talk to you. I said, okay. So I stepped outside. I said, what? I said, what's the matter? She goes, no, they, they, he blacked out. They're not sure why, but they've done the test and we're going to go get results tomorrow. And I said, why is he here? She said, Miss Hustle, he wouldn't let me take him home. He said that if he fainted again, that you'd know what to do. I gave those kids everything I needed when I was 12. Everything I needed, I gave them. They got it. How different life would have been if at 12 years old, somebody would have come to me and said, you know what, you are okay. You're all of that. I like you. You're beautiful. You mean the world to me. And my whole world would be different without you. So I get done with my first week of teaching and the phone rings and it's my little sister. And I thought, that is so cool. I'm putting those relationships back together. She's called to congratulate me on my first week of teaching. And I got on the phone and I said, hey, Mercy. I said, that is so cool that you called. She said, Brenda, I need to, I need to tell you that we just took dad to the hospital. We found out he's got cancer. They're doing surgery on Monday. You need to come to the house. And I started to sob. Because I was sober and I didn't want to go. But I went. I went into my parents' home and I went into the back bedroom and I walked in and there was one bed on one side of the room and one bed on the other. And my dad was sitting on his bed. And all of a sudden, he looked like this little old man. This little old man and this four-year-old child. And I sat on the bed on the other side of the room, and this question came to me. Brenda, can you do for your dad what he could never do for you? I said, yes. And I got up from the bed and I over and I sat next to my father so that my knee touched his knee and my shoulder touched his shoulder. And I looked over at him and I said, Dad, I just want you to know that of all the men that God could have given me to be my father, I am so glad I got you. You mean everything to me. And I am not leaving. And my father stood up. And I stood up. And he put his arms around me and I put my arms around him. And for the first time in my life, 
I exhaled in my father's arms. I finally started to breathe. And I have to tell you, um, his cancer went away. And in December of this last year, it came back. Um, the, we found out two days before Christmas that his colon cancer had come back in his liver, in his lungs, and in his right limb. And they were going to start chemo right away. And um, they started chemo in January. And there were days I'd go see my father, and he was laying in bed, and he couldn't even move. And then I didn't know what to pray for. My dad came to me about two weeks ago, and he said, um, "What do you think about what do you think about if I stop? Because I can't do it." I said, I think that if you want to stop, I it's a good idea. He says, I want to. I said, okay. So he went to the doctor last Wednesday. And he told the doctor, I can't do it anymore. I've got to stop. And the doctor said... That's that's really good that you want to stop because um we ran your blood work and your cancer's gone. <laughs> so I went to go see my father before I came here to see you and I'm walking through the living room of his house and he's got his arm around me and I got my arm around him and he starts to cry. He said, thanks for your prayers. Thanks for not even... I love you. Yeah, yeah. Sober for me has been the ride of my life. You know, you know, ever since Mark called, and I plan to blame it on him for the rest of my life. <laughs> Ever since Mark called to ask me to come speak to you today, everything in my life has fallen completely apart. <laughs> completely. I mean, the wheels right the hell off the mother, okay? I go back to today or tomorrow, and my last day at work is Friday. I lost my job. It's okay, it sucked. Um, it was great. Last October I was teaching and God came to me and said, let's finish paying off that karmic debt from Catholic school. What do you want to do next? I said, I don't know. What do you want me to do? He said, I got this little job for you, but you won't be able to stay there very long and it'll be really painful and hard, but um, I need you to go. And I said, well, then I'll go. So I took a job with Head Start. And the reason I took a job with Head Start is because I have a God who says, you know what, your classroom of 30 people needs to be expanded to 728. And I, w I became the education manager for Head Start, which means that I oversee 18 staff, 120 teachers. Oh, yeah, now they run from the room screaming. Um, <laughs> and I've long believed that if you take care of the people who take care about, everything's taken care of, right? So I went into this program and started taking care of these teachers. I'm like, what do you want? You know, and they're like, are you for real? I said, yeah, if you could have four things. We have 18 centers in 11 counties. I went to see every director. I said, if you could have four things, what would it be? They wrote me down the four things they wanted. I went back to the company who hired me. I said, I'll take the job if you give me these things. I got every single one of them. <laughs> So I'm out leading the parade, right? You know me. I'm like, come on. Now, the reason that they had shut Head Start down was because there was a bunch of crooks running it, and they took a million dollars, and everybody was really pissed, right? So they brought this interim company in. God, some of you probably work for them. Whatever. Um, <laughs> they brought this interim company in to take over Head Start for a little while, and so then they hired people like me. And I went in, and I said, listen, guys, I know you've been through a hard thing. Let's go. We got to work. The kids are here. Let's go. 
So we get everything straightened out. We put a structure in place. We put the systems in place. It's rocking right along. Everybody's happy to be there. They come to me three or four weeks ago and say, listen, we appreciate it. Bye-bye. They're so cute. They think I'm going to work there as long as they say I'm going to there. I'm going to work there until God says this is your last day, you know. And so um, that's what God meant when he said you won't be there very long. And people are like, what are you going to do next? I'm like, I'm on a need-to-know basis. I obviously don't need to know before Friday. (laughs) You know, so I've lost my job. Um, I've had to move out of the place where I was living. I've had a partner for eight, eight and a half years. um, And we may have actually come to the end of the road. And it's the first time I figured out how to do the end of the road while I'm still in love. I get to do that sober. I didn't know how to do that when I got here. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I may be packed. Um, (laughs) And I didn't have to rush home to go see. I stayed to speak this morning. What the hell is that about? She's a good packer. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. (laughs) Shut up. (laughs) You know, I don't know what the hell time it is, but I'm going to share something out of the book and then I'm going to go home. I'll miss you, by the way. I didn't know how to tell you that before I got here. I didn't know how to tell you that I was going to miss you. You know, that I showed up here a few years ago, five years ago or so, you know, and I and I didn't know any of you. And I stood up in a workshop. I said, you know what? I'm sick and tired of you people knowing each other and no one hugs me. I said, that won't do. I need a hug. And then people I didn't know started hugging me. And that's how I started to become friends with some of them. You know, and, and, and I and I love that. And all every year before the roundup, can I make coffee? Can I, I, every year, every year, I, I, I even volunteer people who come with me who don't know they're being volunteered. <laughs> I've said over and over, if there's anything we can do from San Angelo, there's many people as we go, you know. Um, and, and I said to Kimberly the other day, I said, Kimberly, I, she said, how is it that you wound up speaking? I said, I don't know. I said, I volunteered to make coffee. She said, God, what must your coffee be like? <laughs> I said, I don't know, but I don't think they've heard about the ashtrays. <laughs> I love the books. I love the information in the books. I love the map. I love the fact that they're numbered. I love the fact that all I have to do is work and not make them up. That's already done and I just get to follow. That I see better with my eyes closed. That I know more when I don't talk. That I love you because I love you. And all I need back from you is nothing. I have relationships with you that don't look like this anymore. They look like this. Huh? Why? Because God has changed my life. One story at a time, one moment at a time, one memory at a time, one feeling at a time. And I'm just here to tell you that if you're new, you need permission to go pick up whatever tool you need to pick up, I'm going to give it to you. If you find God in the forest, go there. If you find God in the water, go there. If you find God in the quiet, go there. It says in the final analysis, it is within us that he is found. Service gladly rendered obligations squarely troubles well accepted or solved with God's help the knowledge that at home and in the world outside we are partners in a common effort the understood fact that in God's sight all human beings are important The proof that love freely given surely brings a full return. The certainty that we no longer need to be isolated and alone in self-constructed prisons. The surety that we need no longer be square pegs trying to fit into round holes. 
that we belong and fit in the God's scheme of things. These are the permanent and legitimate satisfactions of right living. For which there is no amount of pomp and circumstance. No heap of material possessions that could possibly substitute. True ambition is not what we thought it to be. True ambition is a deep desire to live usefully and to walk humbly under the grace of God. I love you. I'll miss you. God bless you. That's it. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.